welcome everyone. Thank you for coming. Start in just a few minutes. Get some more people in here. Thank you for coming, everyone. We'll start in just uh, uh, just a few minutes. We have more people coming into the into the talk. Okay, welcome everyone to the first of a new series of virtual lectures, The Bronx in Conversation. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. G. Hermelin, a native Bronxite who graduated from the Bronx School's PS94, JSH80, and the Bronx High School of Science, then CCNY and Columbia University. The author is a historian, explorer, educator, public speaker, producer, and publisher of over 190 publications and scores of multimedia productions. He is the founding creator and designer of the Bronx County Historical Society Research Library and the Bronx County Archives. He is the president of the History of the New York City Project, the CEO of the Bronx County Historical Society, and a noted consultant to museums and nonprofits. And it's my uh, great pleasure to introduce this talk on uh, Geography of the Bronx, which is dedicated to Bronx sites here and afar. Uh, so take it away, Doc. I think that was my line, wasn't it, at the end? <laughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Doc Hermelin, and I recently wrote The Geography of the Bronx. Now, of course, the question becomes, well, why would you write a book about geography, much less about geography of the Bronx? So first, let's consider what exactly is geography. Well, it's the quest to understand the physical and cultural features of places and their natural settings on the surface of the earth. Well, that's a mouthful, but very important in terms of understanding how the world truly exists around us. For, for me, I, I've always felt that the Bronx is the center core of my, of my knowledge base. When I would travel, I would travel with the Bronx as a map in my head. As you see here, the cover of the book itself, it shows you the 238th Street Stair Street, which is the longest stair street, which we'll discuss a little later in the, in the book. The, the whole notion of why I can say that I dream of the Bronx is because of places like this. The Bronx River Gorge, there's postcards from well, around 1910, when people see this, they have no idea this could possibly be in the urban Bronx. But in fact, the Bronx, with its 42 square miles, and I'll interject facts as we go along with, the, with our discussion today, over 24% of its land is actually open land. Now, that's either parks, playgrounds, or the three big cemeteries, Woodlawn Cemetery, and of course, St. Raymond Cemetery, and then Hart Island, which is a cemetery for the indigenous right off of City Island. So when I say to you that I dream of the Bronx and it's 42 square miles, I actually do. I compare things when I go to different places. It's literally my mental map for physical and human features. And it makes for me evidence about how experience influences one's perception of place. I've had this discussion with a number of people, but those that travel or have lived in many places, they don't have that same sense of one place that they can memorize to, that they can adjust to. But when you think about the Bronx and its 42 square miles, it's sort of interesting to think in terms of size. To me, the Bronx was always very big. It was a very big place. It was a great distance to walk across. But then if you think about it, Paris, France, has 41 square miles. 41 square miles. Um, San Francisco is 47 square miles. New York City in total 
is 303 square miles. Boston is 48 square miles. Now, a lot of the great big cities, especially in Texas or even Beijing in China, they absorb other areas around them. So they keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. The map of New York City, as, as is the map of the Bronx, has been solidly the same since 1898. We've not added on anything. So Yonkers, just north of us, is north of us. We haven't absorbed them. We haven't all. So for me, my map of the world is based on the contours of the Bronx, for it breaks it down for me in a more understanding pieces. Why do this at all? Well, the truth is, unfortunately, students do not have basic understanding of geography. They're not taught geography anymore. It was a separate course. They're not taught civics, in fact, much less history. So here we're going to attempt the Historical Society of Bronx County to help solve what I hope was an immediate problem. I've had a number of young fellows, um, women um, who were high school age, had no sense of what North and South was. None whatsoever. Didn't understand East and West. They would travel. They would go down to Manhattan, but they didn't understand where they were going or why they were going. This map here of the Bronx in 1895 is after the city, in the city in this case is just Manhattan. Just bear with us here. If you look at the middle of the river, if you look in the middle of the uh, of the borough there, you'll see, let me get myself a, uh, a better view of it. You'll see that there is the river that courses through its entire length. That's the Bronx River. The Bronx River, West of the Bronx River was taken into the city of New York in 1874. In 1895, the area east of the Bronx River was taken in. And then in 1898, the greater city of New York was incorporated. And that's how the borough of the Bronx began. We weren't a county then. We were still part of Westchester, uh, part of Manhattan. But all of it was part of Westchester County at one point. Now, this book is not about history per se. While it deals in certain aspects of it, it really is a way in which you can adjust yourself to what is currently. What is the current situation? Where are we currently for the borough of the Bronx? The real question becomes, what is the land and how is it utilized? So at 42 square miles, the Bronx has considerable land. Some people say it's the fourth smallest of the borough. I call it the fourth largest of the borough. Also in population, it's the fourth largest. It's only section, we should realize, that's on the mainland. It is the reason why everything connecting to Manhattan and the Northeast and Queens has to come through the Bronx, through bridges and highways. If you look at that map, you'll notice that it's not really a straight north-south. It's actually slightly bends to the northeast. Now, that's important to realize because most people have no sense of maps anymore. And that's why we put a number of maps into this, into this book. So you have a little sense and get a little, little way in which you can well, perhaps better understand things. I still use my Hagstrom map every time I travel somewhere. Uh, Hagstrom is a, an old company. Actually, it's probably over 100 years old. And they have great maps. Yes, you can, with the new computers in, the, in your uh, phone and in the... Uh, in your vehicle, you don't have to even know where you are. Just put in, plug in a, a, a place and it'll tell you, well, I don't like that. I like traveling around. I like knowing where I'm going. And getting lost is not a problem, especially when you have the map in your head. And that's what you usually do. Now, another consideration is how many, if we're such a water, how many would you say miles are in a, around us. Well, you take a look at the waterways there. With these irregular waterways, it's probably about 80 miles of waterways. That's a lot of, a lot of area in the boundary, a lot of area. So the Bronx really developed and grew along its edges, along roads, valleys, ridgetops. Geology greatly affected Bronx history and its growth. 
east of the Bronx River, to the right of the middle river there, is flat land and sandy soil, excellent for farming. The elevation lowered to the East River and Long Island Sound. Poe Cottage, from its vantage point on the Grand Concourse Plateau, once commanded a view over the rolling hills all the way to the shores of Long Island Sound. It's hard to believe today that you could actually be at Fordham Road and look across and see things like that. When we were preparing this book, I asked the noted author, Dr. Eric Sanderson, who wrote Manhattan, which discussed the original natural history of Manhattan uh, before contact with Europeans. And I asked him, give me a general sense, use the, the old term seven, seven wonders of the Bronx. And the, this was his answer, Goose Island, Hunter Island, both of which are in Pelham Bay Park area, North and South Brothers Island in the East River, the Thane Forest in New York Botanical Gardens, used to be called the Hemlock Forest, the Bronx River Gorge, which you just saw, and then the Van Cortland Park Preserve. I then added my man-made features because again, geography is about natural features and man-made features on that land. So for, for me, my first response was the High Bridge Aqueduct Bridge. The High Bridge Aqueduct Bridge is a, the oldest bridge standing in the Bronx, the oldest one. The Kingsbridge Armory is the second. Morris High School and uh, Morris High School Auditorium, which, by the way, has the finest acoustics in the borough. The New York Botanical Garden Conservatory, Orchard Beach, the um, Grand Concourse and Boulevard, and then, of course, the parks and parkway systems. These island maps that you just saw, one showing the East River, the other showing the Long Island Sound ones, had to be developed because it turns out that the Parks Department and the, even the Planning Commission didn't have them. We had to create them. But since I had traveled to all of these islands anyway, it was fairly easy to discern which and where these places were. New York City is, of course, a coastal city bounded by the Hudson River, the Atlantic Ocean, and Long Island Sound. The Bronx is bounded by the Hudson River, the East and Harlem Rivers, and Long Island Sound. On its north, you'll see the area landmasses of the city of Yonkers, Mount Vernon, the village of Pelham Manor. The highest point in the Bronx is 290 feet tall, located in Fieldston, in someone's backyard, who truly do not appreciate having people come and see it. There's a, there's a special marker. He didn't know, it turned out, when I went there to see that particular site, after they were building these, these structures, these houses, large houses, he had no idea that he was the highest point of the Bronx. And he didn't like it, the owner. <laughs> the highest building in the Bronx is the Bronx River Park Towers on the Harlem River located in the Roberto Clemente State Park, the only state park in the Bronx. It's it has a height of 428 feet. As I've said before, 24% of its land is parkland and open space, including the three very large cemeteries. What I did with this, and here you can see a map from another 1985 one, that the great John McNamara, the the noted historian actually put together for us, actually put together for me because I asked him, show me the neighborhoods, John, in some general way. And he did. And that's really what that is. But it gives you a nice sense of the borough, the borough's placement. You see that northeast sort of angle to it. And over to the right, you see City Island. And then Hart Island is right next to that, right next to City Island. The... Um, here we have the Kingsbridge Armory. The Kingsbridge Armory, this is from 1978, this particular picture. The Kingsbridge Armory was once the largest interior space building in the world. Uh, Saudi Arabia now claims to have an armory bigger than this. But anybody who's ever been inside the armory has no sense until they get into it to realize how big it is. If you look at this picture, it looks like those 
people. You see, there are people down there and, and cars. That's real. That's a real photograph. It's not a made up photograph. The armory was truly one of the great buildings. And here it was located in the, in the Bronx. It has 15 acres. From now on, I'm going to start talking. Whenever I talk of a building or a site, I'm going to discuss what it has. It's on 15 acres of land. The Franklin Avenue Armory, located more in the South Bronx, has uh, one and a half acres. It's no longer an armory. Neither is the Kingsbridge Armory. And of course, the fort is a fort, Fort Schuyler. That's our main fort. One of my favorite sites is in this woodcut, as they say, the notorious Black Swamp. If I was standing before you, I'd ask, is anybody, had anyone heard of the Black Swamp? Formerly located near Claremont Park, this woodcut was made in 1906. The Black Swamp is quite a place. They could not fill it in in the 19th century. They kept dumping things in it, and it would rise up again. It was like it had no it had no depth of known things. It took forever into the 1890s before they finally filled it in. However, to this day, when there are very large rainstorms, two inches, three inches, the, the apartment buildings around what had been the Black Swamp near Claremont Park actually have black goo come up out of the basements. The next part is we're going to deal with the bays and lagoons. Bays and lagoons, well, we only really have a couple here. East Chester Bay, which adjoins Long Island Sound. We sort of saw that on the previous map picture. And Leroy Bay, which is now part of Pelham Bay Park and part of Pelham Bay Park Lagoon, which was actually the original Pelham Bay for which the park, the neighborhood, and the station was named. Its current shape was this designed after Orchard Beach was constructed, as well as the Orchard Beach, you know, parking area, and the connection of Hunter Island, Twin Islands, and Rodman's Neck, which, by the way, that's the police department's firing range. Bridges have a tremendous impact on our, on our land in, in, in general. The bridges connect the Bronx to Queens, Manhattan, and to City Island. The construction and foundations of bridges greatly changed the local topography. Here is the Henry Hudson Bridge. Henry Hudson Parkway goes across it. This is in right over the Spite and Dival Hill, which we'll talk about a little later on. Next one. Here we have the High Bridge Bridge from 1887. The High Bridge was this spectacular bridge. It's the oldest standing bridge in the Bronx. And it was not so much for walking across to Manhattan, but it was actually designed to hold pipes that held the water, the first water system for New York City. And in fact, on the Manhattan side, there was a tower. And that tower, they pumped water up to the tower, about, uh, about 80 feet tall. And from that tower, they let gravity come down and then feed Washington Heights. The water, this water system was a gravity fed system, except for that one tower. Next one. The, the high bridge is very much known for its, let me just get a better picture of this. Here we have a map showing the creation of the United States Harlem River Ship Canal, which actually took quite a lot of years, 1816 to 1938 to construct. Now, what it really did was completely divide Manhattan from the Bronx. But as you can see from that first slide, there's a lot of activity there. It seems to have a lot of bends. It does indeed. It does indeed. The way in which we are uh, just trying to find my way to this here. Okay, let me go up a little bit. Perfect. As you can see in the first one, they're still calling it in 1817, Tippett's Hill, which later became Spite and Dival Hill. That's part of Westchester County. And here you see Spite and Dival Creek, which no longer exists, just been absorbed. And by the time you get to the lower end, the United States Ship Canal, at least this section, 
by the way, for those of us in the Bronx, it's really called the Harlem River Ship Canal. But it's the lowest end of the very large ship canal system of New York State, the one that goes all the way up the Hudson and then goes into the Erie Canal and finally works its way out to places like Ohio, et cetera, and of course, the, uh, the Great Lakes. The canal system of New York State is what created the ability for New York State to become the empire city, the place where everything came to. Next. Next, discussing goes through canals and caves and tunnels. Yes, there were canals. This is the Mott Haven Canal, the early 1900s, right in the South Bronx and Mott Haven area. This uh, particular one has been filled in, though there's still a street, the Canal Street. This was very important because there are a lot of factories in this area and they needed a cut through. And of course, we just discussed the U.S. Ship Canal as part of the canal system. This was not part of that. This was not part of that. Here is another print of the Harlem River Ship Canal, 1895. That little section in the back there where the factory smokestacks are, that was cut through. And that little piece that we have where it, in the back where, to the right of those factory smokestacks, you see a cut there, that's where the railroad goes through. And you could still see that cut if you're, if you're wide awake when you're taking your train ride. And of course, here's the Broadway Bridge right in front of us. Next. And of course, in order to know about tunnels, you got to know about the subway system because there are a lot of tunnels in the subway system. And my favorite, of course, is the hundred is coming out of the uh, coming out of um, uh, the number four train, working my way there and finding myself all of a sudden after Yankee Stadium in a tunnel. <laughs> As you can see, most of these, in fact, almost all of them really are north-south accesses. And until for a long time, there was no real east-west access. I mean, yes, we eventually had trolleys, but and trolleys did go all across the borough, all across the borough. Next. Here we have one of the colleges and universities. Now, the Bronx was always known as the borough of universities and parks, and for good reason. This particular one is located at Maritime College. Notice the uh, White Stone Bridge behind it. The, this college is also the one that has the Fort Schuyler as part of it. And it has a fair size, fair size grounds. Many of these, it has 55 acres, in fact. The other places that have very large acreage would, would be Fordham University has 85 acres. College of Mount St. Vincent has 70 acres. Bronx Community College, which is the old NYU uptown campus, has 18 acres. And even Manhattan College, which always seems small, actually has 23 acres. Each of these places in, usually have a a park stadium or fields. And this is one of those fields right along the East River. Okay, next. Now here is an old favorite of mine. This is a 19th century um, glass negative shot of an old mill. We eventually triangulated and found out where this mill was along the Hutchinson River. It literally is in dead center or close to dead center co-op city in present day, De Kroof Place. All of this was filled in. So when you hear that Co-op City was really a filled in area, that's right, it was, because it was part of the Hutchinson River area. And so a lot of swamps in this area. And in the book, I talk about the building of Co-op City and of filling things in as we'll go in a little while. Next. One of, the, one of the most arranged things that we try and do at the Historical Society is to really get to know the borough and the city as much as possible. 
we established a number of expeditions to travel around the, the, the boundaries of the city using canoes and kayaks. And here is one that we did in 1976. And notice the, the, the sizing of Co-op City. It's truly an enormous place. And in fact, one of the largest places in the entire United States. It has over 55,000 residents, 35 high rises like that one that you're looking at. And they are over 30 stories tall. It also has 220 uh, three-story townhouses, which is most people don't realize that. So here we have Co-op City with 55,000 residents. Parkchester, another private housing development, has 40,000 residents. When you think about this, I love to use the example in Baltimore, uh, outside of Baltimore in Maryland, they uh, created a place they called New City. It was a brand new area, brand new place for people to live. It has 12,000 people. It sort of puts it to shame when you think about Co-op City in Parkchester. Co-op City is and remains one of the more unusual um, developments around the country for this private partnership, as we like to call it, private partnership. And it was here, as you can see from the, 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 the sheer magnitude and size of the buildings, that there was so much to be seen. But in fact, it was once a cucumber farm, one of the biggest cucumber farms in the United States. It's hard to believe. It also was the home of Freedom Land, I don't know how many of you remember Freedom Land or ever heard of it, but Freedom Land was the Bronx's answer to Disneyland. That's Disneyland in California, not the one down in Florida. And it lasted for three years and then went bankrupt. <laughs> one reason is because in the wintertime, they couldn't run different things. They had a lot of program and it was a design to look like the, <laughs> excuse me, to look like the map of the United States. Next. <coughs> ah, here we have one of the great cultural institutions of the borough. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, better take a gumdrop here. I remember the first time I saw the Enid Haupt Conservatory in the New York Botanical Gardens. It wasn't called that then. It was just called the Conservatory. What a remarkable building. Just a remarkable building with all sorts of plants. And to this day, it is just a magnificent place to visit in the botanical gardens. Next. This is an aerial view of the Bronx Zoo. Actually, it's an aerial view of the Bronx River. You see those rivers, those bridges going over? We don't even talk about those bridges. That's Those are monorail bridges going over the Bronx River because that's part of Wild Asia. And this is from 1983. They call the Bronx River in this section of the zoo the Irrawaddy. This is named after an Indian river. But they can't fool us. It's the Bronx River. Next. This is the, which this was a very well-known place, boathouse and restaurant on the Bronx River. This is the end of the Bronx River. I'm no longer here. This is gone. But people truly remember they would rent boats. They would go around. They had to be careful. But there were barriers because in a little while you see that there was a 15-foot waterfall right at the end of the Bronx River in the Bronx River part of the zoo. Next. Now let's talk about markets. Okay, one of the more well-known ones, of course, is Arthur Avenue the Retail Market. That's about an eight, uh, I would say about a um, one and a quarter uh, acres, but while it doesn't have the, the the great play of some of the ones I'll talk about, it is a very well known area, and it was built during the Laguardia uh, Mayor Laguardia because they had all these push carts on Arthur Avenue, and eventually they realized, well, why don't we put the push carts into a market and enclose it so they're not, you know, when it when it rains or there's inclement weather, they're able to have the market. The market is still a wonderful place for foods. Next, here is the 2017 aerial view of the new Filton Fish Market. 
Now remember, the Fulton Fish Market was located in, in the southern end of Manhattan, but it really became very bedraggled. And so they decided, well, let's start up something new. Let's have a new building. This particular building is five acres. Over to the right, if you could make out these other buildings that are there, that's part of the Hunts Point market, which is about 23 acres. That's one of the largest um, markets in the country. All Any place you go to in New York City, and also Westchester County, to buy foodstuffs, you know, vegetables and, and fruits, they're coming here. In the middle of the night, they're coming to get their foods and stuff. And so this is all part of it. And this is in the Hunts Point area. Next. Ah, the Grand Concourse. And remember, its official name is the Grand Concourse and Boulevard. This is the construction of one of the transverse roads. That was a new idea. They never did that. Um, the Grand Congress was designed after the Champs-Élysées in Paris. And you could say that Queens Boulevard is the same. Queens Boulevard is a little bigger, but they didn't have transverse roads, so you can get under and not have to go over the actual concourse itself and thus made traffic much easier. It was a brilliant idea and worked very, very well. This was completed in 1909, about 12 years, and it was an immediate economic success for the Bronx. Transverse roads really made a difference. If you think about Central Park, it has a little bit of transverse roads, but for the most part, it, it cuts through and you could still see above you. It doesn't have this thing above you like that, you know, bridge. Next. <clears throat> this is the end of the Grand Concourse. The end of the Grand Concourse is at Marshall Parkway. We're talking about parkways very shortly. Initially, it was just a couple of maybe three miles. Eventually, it was enlarged to be about seven miles all the way through. What a view. I love taking people on the Grand Concourse, driving them down. It used to be a little easier to drive, but now they've made the, the lights. <laughs> the lights seem to work <clears throat> immediately to uh, stop you every, every street. They don't want you to be driving very fast, to say the least. It used to be that the concourse <clears throat> was set up for horse and buggies on the left side. And now, of course, once really once cars really came in, automobiles, it was really everything. All the sides would use that way. Next slide, please. Well, now, this spaghetti that you're looking at, <clears throat> this is the uh, famous, or I should say infamous, Bruckner Interchange. These are, it's a connection of like six different highways and expressways all come together in the, uh, in the East Bronx area. <clears throat> it's really quite a mess and took forever to grow up to, to develop. I mean, there have been books on this and movies and all sorts of uh, ways in which there was a discussion about what to do, how to do it. Should we finish it? But of course they had to finish it or else they'd never be able to connect everything. And the aim was to connect well, using this and all the other bridges, including the Whitestone and the, and the uh, Throg's Neck, and eventually to get up into Westchester and, of course, towards Boston, which was the aim, was to make sure everything was done. Highways, basically, we'll talk, think of a highway as a connecting road, but the true connecting roads were parkways. Parkways in the Bronx were really quite something. That was a idea that came to pass, which I'll talk about a little later, but it came to pass because there were these ways in which, well, how would you get from one point to another if you had these new parks that had just been developed? And the answer is Marshall Parkway connects Bronx Park to Van Cortland Park. Pelham Parkway connects Bronx Park to Pelham Bay Park. Crotona Park, the way it connects Crotona Park to Bronx Park. Most Bronx highways run north and south along the edges. It was the Cross Bronx Expressway that made the first major roadway to run across the center of the borough, west to east. It connected it to the George Washington Bridge. Next. 
The um, the other thing we have to talk about is golf courses. Golf courses are, there is a lot of golf courses. Well, five of them. They represent about 689. Next, please. 689 acres over five courses. <clears throat> There's the Marshalloo, 62 acres in Van Cortland Park. Van Cortland Park course, which was 55 acres. By the way, the oldest municipal golf course in in the United States in 1895. Remember, municipal golf course, not private. There's the Pelham Bay Golf Course and the Split Rock Golf Course, which combined are 350 acres. And then we have the former, former Trump Golf Links in Ferry Point Park, which has 222 acres. Golf courses played a major role then in the borough of the Bronx. Now let's get to hills. Somebody asked me once, are there hills in the Bronx? Oh, there are hills in the Bronx, all right. <clears throat> they were used as a reference point for many boundaries. And there are recognizable names even today. Currently, they often exist in maps today. Now, to even give you a count of some of these hills is a little much, but this one here is called Spite and Dival Hill. I actually used to live over to the right of that, up on top of that hill. <clears throat> you look at the Palisades across the way there. This was the waterway that eventually became the Harlem River Ship Canal, or as I said, the U.S. Ship Canal. So the Hudson River is on the other side of that. This was pretty high, actually. I'll try and show you some things, but just to give you an idea of the hills, there were names like Breakneck Hill, Brendan Hill, Castle Hill, which were actually named by the explorer Adrian Block. When his, after his ship burned down in 1613, he was forced to overwinter. And he built a new boat, and in the spring he ventured past Hell Gate, where he viewed what he perceived to be a castle on a hill, while overlooking what is today's Bronx, and that's how Castle Hill got its name. Eagle Hill, Font Hill, which is on the grounds of uh, Mount St. Vincent, College of Mount St. Vincent, which has over 161 feet of elevation. Fordham Hill, Gun Hill, James Hill, which is part of St. Mary's Park. Marble Hill, where the Harlem River Ship Canal was completed. Rose Hill, which is the campus of Fordham University. Snake Hill, boy, I would love to ask people. Does anyone remember Snake Hill coming down from t Avenue, going right down to Webster Avenue? Used to be a favorite spot for, for people coming on, you know, especially when it was snowing. And uh, you can go down by Toboggan or sled or whatever you had, the top of a garbage can. People love that. And then it became extremely dangerous because Webster Avenue got very busy. Spite and Dival Hill, you see here, is 217 feet in elevation. In, in um, what we call Tetards Hill in Henry Hudson Park is 203 feet. So this is a very high area here. Then we have Tibbetts Hill, Vault Hill behind Van Cortland Family Cemetery, behind Van Cortland Park. Uh, Van Cortland Mansion, and of course, Wave Hill. Next. What I'd like to show, this is our Bronx Afghan. Um, it's actually missing a couple of pieces on the bottom. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and it gives you some idea. Um, my sister-in-law came from, back from a trip in uh, New England, and she brought with her a, uh, a uh, Afghan. And it was all these places in the in the uh, northern regions of New Hampshire and Vermont. And I thought to myself, well, this should work for us. And so we created the Bronx Afghan. And as you can see from some of them, they have all the historic houses on it. There really are 12. <laughs> Something happened to it. And there is the bat. You see the 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 second, the middle, the middle section there on the left side. You see the bat from old Yankee Stadium? That bat still stands. And the bat is actually um, part of what it will, well, it's now part of the, part of where the uh, uh, a new park, it's across the street is the new Yankee Stadium. So this one was demolished, was made into a, an area, a running track, and except, but they kept, they kept the, uh, the, 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 what was a chimney, but it looked like a, a, a mat. 
Okay. On the lower right, you have, and then that's good. Go, go back. Here is the Hall of Fame for great Americans. Hall of Fame is on the campus of Bronx Community College, originally opened by NYU. It was opened in 1894. It's, it's filled with the bus of great Americans. It overlooks the Harlem River and is really quite a high mark at 170 feet in elevation. It's also 10 feet or more above Cedric Avenue. The architects created a huge wall that was topped by the 600 foot length of an open air colonnade where those sculptured busts would be located, dedicated to America's luminaries in many fields. The hall's area is two acres and its centerpiece is the Gould Memorial Des Library designed by Stanford White. This is the first hall of fame. Everything else came after this. You could make out the bus if you look closely, you could see them and you could go there. It's still there. It's available. It's free. You can go in. You could also see the magnificent Gould Memorial Library. Next. And so we come to uh, an area here that is another favorite of mine, Ice Ages, Bedrocks, and Erratics. Well, what is this, you may ask? Well, that's an erratic. What is an erratic? An erratic is what's left behind by a receding glacier. So let's go through this now. By the way, it doesn't mean that that's the same rock as what's on the bedrock. No, in fact, it's usually quite different. This is the one that's in Pelham Bay Park, and we'll have a little story about that a little later. The Wisconsin glaciation was one of the last of the four great ice ages over a period of about a million and a half years. About 18,000 years ago, the ice began melting from our region and retreated north rather quickly, geologically speaking. So by about 12, 13,000, we had no ice. The bedrock of the Bronx is made up of metaphoric, meta, metamorphic rock, including Fordham Nice, which is the oldest rock, about 1.1 billion years old, Manhattan Schist, 495 million years old, and sections of Yonkers Nice, 575 million, and then finally, the softer inward marble in Marble Hill, about 470 million years ago. Nice contains a lot of, and Nice is G-N-E-I-S-S, -S, contains a lot of pink feldspar. Schist contains a lot of mica. And marble is metamorphosized limestone. The Wisconsin glacier ice was probably as thick as 1,000 feet at its edge in the Bronx of Manhattan and over two miles thick, think of that, at a point north in its peak period. During this last ice age, the glaciers reshaped the land and carved out the Hudson River Valley and Long Island, and then dropped its load of large rocks, gravel, sand, and a terminal moraine on the back of what is now Long Island. You also see it in Queens and in Brooklyn, and across the Narrows in New Jersey and Staten Island. In the Bronx, there are many as we now will see of these glacial erratics. Next. They have all sorts of names. This was, was one of the most famous ones. It still is there. It's part of the zoo. There used to be a rocking stone restaurant. You literally could touch this rock and it would move back and forth. The zoo didn't like that. Eventually they covered it off. It's still between buildings. They don't like showing it off anymore. They're worried that someone might crush their, their hand or their foot. But they were rocks that had all sorts of names. Saxon Rock, Indian Prayer Rock, Mighty Joe Young, Lion Rock, Black Rock. And of course, one of the most well-known rocks are Glover's Rock. And Glover's Rock, and of course, Glover's Rock is in uh, Pelham Bay Park as you go towards uh, Orchard Beach. And then, of course, here we have the famed Rocking Stone Rock. One of the largest erratics that we've ever heard of was a 40-foot tall one called Pudding Rock, which was destroyed when Boston Road was widened near Caldwell Avenue in the 19th century. They had to blast it, that's for sure. Now, in the West, the Bronx has a number of ridges running north and south, each with a valley of softer inward marble, such as found in Jerome and Webster Avenues, and they held waterways, again created by the glacier. The Grand Concourse section was built on a high plateau of hard Manhattan schists, which helps explain stair streets. Next. 
Here's a steep rock outcropping at St. Mary's Park. Most people don't realize, look at the size of that rock outcropping. Now, this is an outcropping. This is not an erratic. This is the bedrock. This is Bronx bedrock. This was 1954. Next. Islands. You've already heard me talk about my... Uh, my love affair with islands. I love, I used to live on City Island. I love going out and visiting all these islands. Now, some of them are only only visible when it's uh, low tide, which means, of course, that there may be new islands that will show up one day, or some of these islands may go down. As you see on Hunter Island, which was a separate island, and there were a number of mansions on it as well, and Two Tree Island and Twin Island, they were, and Rodman's Neck, they were all separate. And then Robert Moses put together this thing called Orchard Beach, which is what you see there in the center, and connected everything. And as we talked about the lagoon uh, between Hunter Island and that word, the Bronx, you'll see the Pelham Bay Park Lagoon. And now you see where the Hutchinson River comes back into East Chester Bay and thus Long Island Sound. Next. This is the Chimney Sweeps Island. Go back a second. Go back to the previous one so we can see. Where's Chimney Sweeps? Right above High Island. Now, someone might say, what is High Island? High Island is a privately owned island that has its own bridge connecting to um, the city island, the, the, the main part of city island. It actually has uh, radio towers on it. It was used for many years, and it's privately owned, about 23 acres. Okay, Next. Here's Chimney Sweeps. So right above there was the Chimney Sweeps Island. Now, occasionally, people would put houses on it, put buildings. They would live on it, very much like the Thimble Islands up in Connecticut. Next. To understand the city, you really have to understand landfill. Um, a good section of the city of New York has been filled in, including places like Kipps Bay down in uh, Manhattan. And as you can see from the black, the black part is the fill-in. This is this shows you how much was actually filled in. Now look at the Bronx. Queens, of course, you see all of it. When you look at the Bronx, you see there's quite a bit that was filled in. Uh, needless to say, Pelham Bay Park, and there were sections down in Throg's Neck, very swampy. Very, very swampy. And so they filled it in. How did they fill it in, you say? Well, they filled it in in many different ways. And one of the ways was to use garbage. <laughs> And they also used, you know, old logs and cement and things from streets and avenues. But for the most part, garbage. Orchard Beach was a garbage fill-in. That's how they did it. The big scows of uh, garbage-laden boats would bring in and just go and dump stuff into that area to create, eventually, land. Obviously, they had to put a lot of, a lot of dirt on it. But eventually, that's what they did. Rikers Island, for example, which uh, we, you know, we were talking about the islands before. Rikers Island, which is one of the one of the penal institutions in New York City, is actually part of Queens because it's connected to Queens by a bridge. But it actually it should be part of the Bronx because it's close enough to the to us. The Rikers Island island itself was originally only forty nine acres. But landfill of garbage and ashes, remember all coal, the, the city was heated by coal. So the ashes of coal were then placed and street refuse and eventually enlarged it to 413 acres between the Bronx and Queens. When the Rikers dump was closed in 1939, the fill was sent to Soundview Park and later the site of the Trump golf course as well. Next. Ah, Bronx River Falls. Right above that falls is where that the boathouse was. But of course, they had chains and they had barriers so people wouldn't float and go over it. Most of the waterfalls, even the lakes and ponds, are the results of dams to hold water for mills, factories, and vistas. It's important to understand that that's the case. But there are quite a few lakes, ponds, and waterfalls. Next. This one was man-made only about 10 years ago. 
this little waterfalls. It's part of Rock Garden Park, which is also part off of, off of Longfellow Avenue called Hiawatha Falls. Not very big, but it's all attached to what became Waterfall Park, which is at the end of the Bronx Zoo. For my money, it's one of the best parks. It's small, but you got this waterfall. It's really quite something. Next. Here is an old, this is a, a postcard for Van Cortlandt Park Lake. And it showed you what used to be, the lake was dammed. And then what they used it for was a gristmill. And to, and to, make, um, to make wheat into flour. Next. Uh, I guess I should mention, yeah, let's mention it. So there are other falls. There's Bol Bolton Falls, just south of Fordham Road, which is a set of two falls near the Buffalo Paddock in the Bronx Zoo. And in fact, on one of our expeditions down the Bronx River, um, there's a couple of uh, of the authorities at the Bronx Zoo called me the night before, but I, I, I didn't answer, as it turned out. And they wanted to deny the expedition access to, to uh, going through the zoo. But you see, they have no right to do that. And we went through anyway. But we had to lower the canoes by rope in order to get in, to get down. Um, Bronx Lake, they call it that, but it's a one mile long lake in the Bronx Zoo. That's what we saw earlier. That's about 25 acres. The Bronx River Falls, which we're not showing, which is part of the New York Botanical Gardens, near the old Lorillard Snuff Mill, now the Stone Mill. There's also Cope Lake, in the Bronx Zoo. Bronx Zoo has a number of little areas where they, for some reason, well, not for some reason, they really wanted to do it. Um, then we have the Delafield Ponds up in Riverdale. The Delancey Falls, just outside of the southern boundary of the Bronx Zoo. The uh, Hollers Pond, located in Seton Falls Park. Indian Lake in Cretona Park, three-acre body of water, known as Cretona Lake. Indian Pond in Fieldston, has some of the has some of the most expensive housing around it. It's a really it's a private pond now, but you could go up there. You can go up Fieldston Road and make your way to it. Jerome Park Reservoir, originally a large freshwater wetland, was filled in for Jerome Park Racetrack and then excavated for the reservoir. Still exists. Lord's Grotto, College of Mount St. Vincent. Very small, but there it is. There's a native plants garden waterfall in the New York Botanical Garden. Seton Fall Park, again, has Rattlesnake Brook going through the park. Now, the brook runs into a sewer. The falls and Hollers Pond utilize city water today. Then there's the Spite and Dival Shorefront Park, which has a small freshwater pond right underneath the Henry Hudson Bridge. Twin Lakes, again, part of the, part of the Bronx Botanical Gardens, but part of Bronx, Bronx River. Van Cortland Park Lake, which is the largest freshwater lake in the Bronx at 18 acres. And then, of course, we have Woodlawn Lake inside Woodlawn Cemetery, which was artificially uh, established in 1865 when the cemetery was laid out. This picture, the previous picture back there, my father told me a story once about how he uh, he got his first real... Why don't you go back for a second? Uh, the next one. I'm sorry, go to the Bronx River Falls. Yeah, so here we have... So my father was playing in that area in a brand new suit that his mother bought him. It was, of course, used. Nobody had new suits. He had some special affair that he had to go to, and he wore this mohair suit. Anybody that knows about mohair knows that it is tight, can be tight, but definitely itchy. It's one of the worst fabrics I remember as a kid having to wear pants of uh, mohair. It was, it was terrible. You immediately come down with all sorts of uh, hives and things of that nature. Anyway, he and his cousins, Sam and George, went to play in the falls just outside the Bronx Zoo, south of the boathouse that we saw before. And they were skipping stones in the water, playing tag. This is 1934. And he had a lot of fun. It was terrific. And then suddenly he slipped on a wet rock and fell into the water. And the fast waterway pulled him towards the falls. He hollered for help. George, his younger cousin, started laughing, but Sam, his older cousin, grabbed him, pulled him out. The suit was ripped, muddy, and wet. His mother was quite upset, to say the least. Next. Get to that next one, yeah. 
Good, next. Here we have a view of uh, Mara Sandy from Claremont Heights. And we're gonna be talking about heights and things of that nature in a moment. Um, there are all sorts of names. This is a fairly old um, image, as you could see. Next. And here's the Bronx during the colonial area that was created in 1914. And as you can see, you can see a lot of the swampy areas. It's very clear where that is, what that is. But it gives you a nice general sense of the. these maps are all located in this book. And that was the whole idea of putting it in here. Next. An extraordinary thing happened. If you could really read that, but there are a couple of them around. This is the this is the, the tablet that establishes Bronx parks. Very important park. Very important because this extraordinary event occurred was the establishment of the New York City parks and parkways. And I talked earlier about parkways, which were purchased and laid out outside of the New York City boundary. This was 1884. There was a Parks Act of 1884 by the New York State Legislature, which established Van Cortlandt Park, Bronx Park, Pelham Park, St. Mary's, Cortona, and Claremont Parks, and their connecting Marshall, Pelham, and Cortona Parkways. Condemnation took time, so land titles did not vest in the city until about 1888. But it was an extraordinary thing. They were using land that was not part of New York City, but they already thought, well, the Bronx would be part of New York at one point. And that's what created this what parts of the 24% of what the landmass is. With the rapid urbanization and construction of hundreds of apartment buildings, the Bronx, with an area roughly the size of Paris or San Francisco, as I said earlier, has a population equivalent to about the seventh largest city in the United States. Now, remember, it also has this thing within these parks, the Bronx Zoo, the international Bronx Zoo, the Botanical Gardens, Orchard Beach, five golf courses, two golf ranges, two stables, hiking and bridle paths. Yes, we have. We have horse riding, playgrounds, swimming pools, ball fields, nature trails, wildlife preserves, highways, trains, lines, and waterways. The Bronx currently has 401 parks with over 7,200 acres and 195 playgrounds on approximately 195 acres, according to the New York City Parks Department. The largest park is Pelham Bay Park at 22,772 acres, which was a very big assemblage of tidal waterways outside of Jamaica Bay, for that matter. The major marshes were set up from Goose Creek, Hutchinson River, and the lagoon. The park has 13 miles of saltwater shoreline, two public golf courses, a golf range, a driving range, Pelham Bit Stable, and an Olympic rowing lagoon that I showed you earlier. The park also has the largest hardwood forest in the Bronx and two wildlife sanctuaries. Then there's Van Cortland Park, which is the second largest park. It has also Tibbetts Brook going through it and had the dam. But in this particular case, it had 1,146 acres. Today, it has um, the oldest municipal golf course that I discussed, Marshall Golf Course. It has uh, an environmental center, public pool, and the Riverdale Equestrian Center among other things. Third one and the third largest park is Bronx Park at 718 acres and includes the zoo, the gardens, and is bisected by the Bronx River. Next. Here we have Orchard Beach. Um, I, I, is there a Bronx who hasn't been to Orchard Beach? This, uh, you know, the, the Art Deco style of those bathhouses the food court. Um, I have deep memories of um, going to this park. What's interesting for me is I don't like beaches. And so the fact that my family would take me there and I would dig holes. That was my main function. I'm not a beach man. But my memory of this is quite, quite interesting. So this is 1937. Already it had been, at least that part had been established. Next, please. 
there were quite a few pools. They would wonder why would they have pools if they had all these waterways where there's a lot of pollution in the waterways, you know, the, the dumping into the waterways from factories and sewage was extreme. So they created a number of pools. This was a swimming pool at Clawson Point, 1920. This was reputed to be the largest swimming pool in New York City. There still are a number of pools, Alderbrook Pool um, in Riverdale, Barreto Point Park Pool in the South Bronx, Bronx River Playground Pool, Claremont Park Pool, Cortona Pool, the Edenwall Pool, Haffen Pool, Mapes Pool, Mullally Park Pool. Again, a lot of these are part of the part of the parks and recreation centers. And of course, Van Cortland Park Pool and the, the Roberto Clemente State Park. Next, please. The thing about, I should mention, about Orchard Beach, which was called the Riviera of the Bronx, it took four years of landfill and construction to actually create the 115 acres. And the first plans, as I said, brought together Robman's Neck and Hunter Island with a one mile long, 300 foot wide Sandy Crescent Beach, the 50 foot wide promenade with its mall and et cetera, plus a huge parking lot for nearly 5,000 cars built on top of the garbage landfill. The white sand for the beach arrived from the Rockaways and Sandy Hook in New Jersey. Over two and a half million cubic yards of sand was utilized to create the beach. Now let's look at this. This is the Marble Hill Station. Marble Hill, another one of our hills. What's interesting to know is According to the Bronx Planning Commission, the Bronx has about 60 miles of train tracks. Well, broken up into the Metro North Railroad, which is what you're looking at here, and of course, the New York City transit system <clears throat> and its underground railroads. It also has quite a few uh, train yards. In fact, there are something like 12 of them, and they have a substantial amount of size <clears throat> because anytime you have to deal with trains, you have to keep them up have to make sure they're in good shape. And so that's when it was done. Next, please. This is the Melrose Station of the Harlem River Railroad. There are new stations that are going to be put into Pelham Bay Park, or put back, I should say. Um, there used to be a station in the middle of Pelham Bay Park that actually went, that would became a monorail. Unfortunately, it... Uh, fell over in the first run, and uh, nobody wanted to go on it. They thought it was too dangerous, so it only lasted about a year or so. But they're going to put one back for Metro North. Next. <clears throat> Again, look at the subway map, get a sense of where and what this is all about. Next. Here's a view of the aerial of the Williamsbridge Oval in 1938. Soon thereafter, it was emptied. This is part of the water system of New York City, and it was made into a park. This was my park. I used to go to this park, play tennis in here. It has a track, still does. It's a very interesting place. It's also where the Historical Society has a number of its buildings, including the Museum of Bronx History, the 1758 Fieldstone Farmhouse, and the Research Library on Bainbridge Avenue, and the Bronx County Archives. Also, a couple of uh, houses up from the Bronx Research Library. Next, please. Here's the Jerome Park Reservoir, <clears throat> which had been part of, as I had said earlier, had been part of the uh, uh, Jerome Park race course. It was then, half of it was taken over for, in the, about the 1900s, taken over for this, uh, this reservoir, which is active and is the water from the Croton system. And the rest of it was for an educational park, which includes Lehman College, Bronx High School of Science, Dewey Clinton, et cetera. Next. Here's, a, here's one that we really had to dig out. Here is the distribution of the water tunnels in New York City. Notice how they have to come through the Bronx, of course. What we're doing now is building the what we call the water tunnel number three. 
because we have we have never really looked at water tunnel one, which it has leaks in it and needs to be looked at and closely. And so water tunnel three will eventually allow us to go into water tunnel one. And this water tunnel three will go all the way into Staten Island, as you can see. Because most of, well, most of the country, of course, we're using wells. But since we have the purest water coming from the mountains and the Croton system and way above it, it made sense to bring in the water because it's just too many people. It's too dense. So we have the best water. As you can see, this city tunnel too. In Van Cortland Park, there is a, uh, there is a I call it a cavern, but it, it was built and you go down about 230 feet in these uh, rickety elevators and you can see this giant hollowed out cavern. And then that's where the distribution center is for the Bronx. And there is how it ties back in. It was really quite something. We visited it and made sure to see it and, and actually filmed it. Next, please. I like these aerial views of the Bronx. There's something very nice about it. You could see uh, Rikers Island there, North and South Brothers Island on the lower right. Next. And here we have kayaking along the Bronx River Rapids. By the way, there's the botanical gardens. And on that upper right there, you can see that white. That's the that's where the, uh, no, go back to that. Yes, that's where the uh, Bronx River Falls in the botanical gardens is located. This has rapids, believe it or not. And in fact, in one of our first trips, the Historical Society ran, we had these Grumman canoes that we borrowed from the American uh, Red Cross. And it was a two-day event. We went from... Uh, um, all the way up, it's about 30 miles up, and the, uh, you know, where the Croton Dam is, and then we came down, and, uh, well, right about here, soon after that little spot you're looking at, the rapids took one of the canoes, and uh, it filled, and then broke. <laughs> it's the only way to describe it. it. It bent. Now, why do I know? Because it was my canoe. And uh, we got caught. I got caught in a hole between rocks. So we ended up getting the botanical gardens, uh, one of their bulldozers. They pulled the boat out. And Arthur Seifert, one of my main guys, he came and he hammered it out so we could continue to go down the river and finish the, the expedition. We were filming it. We were taking sampling, et cetera. And uh, so eventually we brought back the, uh, the boats. And I, I asked, I, I, I said to the American Red Cross, you know, I was very thankful they didn't charge us. I said, we feel kind of bad that we, you know, we busted up one of your, your brand new canoes. If you'd like, we'll give, you know, we'll all donate blood. <laughs> that didn't go over well. The guy basically threw us out. But we did the expedition. That's what counts. Next. This is Givens Creek, which is long since filled in. But again, in the Pelham area. Next. Oh, we're getting to roads. This is great. Hotels, motels, and B&Bs. We sort of left out. Just so you know, they're mostly small, but they have, there are 74 hotels, motels, and B&Bs as of the writing of this, of this book. Okay, let's continue now. Everyone should know this intersection. Notice the cobblestones. See, 1951, cobblestones were still there. Can you see the trolley tracks? They're right to the right and over to the left when it made the turn into Kingsbridge. You see Rogers Department Store in the end there? Rogers was later taken over by Sears Roebuck. That's the same building. And as you go further down, you could see where Fordham University is located. Okay, continue. Stair Streets. Yes. Over... I would say about 65% of all these stair streets in New York City are on in the borough of the Bronx. A stair street is literally a street, except there's no vehicles on it. Here's one, a stair street at 181st Street uh, to Webster Avenue, around 1910. The largest one I told you about was the cover of the book, which is 238th Street. 238th Street, one, it was very large. And a lot of these buildings, a lot of the buildings that have bought this area actually have what would I'll needlessly say is a an, another entranceway in the building. They have 
a lower interest way, then they had a higher interest way right off of the stairs to get into this area. So it really was quite, quite something. Next. Here's another really large rock outcropping at 149th Street and Caldwell Avenue. This is near St. Mary's Park. We were on the other side of it when I showed you the other picture. You see that fellow there with the P80? He was very famous. We never knew his name. He was the one who always had the sign. And so this was the highways department was doing this. He, he, he we sort of know his hands, but we never saw his face. His job was not to do that. You see those old cars there. Next. Now, before we get to really Marina del Rey, we have to talk about the mounts, the mounts, the necks, and all of the things that represent the names of things that people, well, they really don't even remember anymore. But there were a lot of mounts, necks, points, ridges, and heights. Mounts were quite a few, and there were a number of named mountains in the Bronx. Now, I'm not saying they were very big, but there was Mount Eden, Mount Hope, and Fairmont, which made up Tremont Village. Then there was Mount Fordham, now Bronx Community College. There's also Mount St. Vincent College. In addition, there was Mount Sharon, the high point of Fordham Road in the Grand Concourse. And my favorite, Tallapoosa Point, or the Garbage Mountain in Pelham Bay Park, which is stands at 136 feet in elevation and overlooks Long Island Sound. One quick story about that one is that I used to run, the Historical Society used to run a, uh, a program where we called the Cross Bronx Walk. Cross Bronx Walk went from 207th Street in Manhattan and walked across the Bronx, seven and a half miles. And when we finally made the City Island Bridge, went over, we shook hands, we all went on a bus and went back, and I gave them little certificates that they completed the Cross Bronx Walk. Well, one year, we did it by about, I think, nine years in a row. And one year, I, I brought a group in, and they, this group really wanted to go to the high point because we walked right alongside Tallapoosa Point. And for years, I had not gone on it because I thought, well, you know, the methane is, Tallapoosa Point is a garbage mountain. They filled it with garbage. And so while it was really tall, you know, it's sort of, I wasn't sure. But you know what? This day was beautiful, a lot of wind. So I thought, okay, it'd be all right. So there's three levels to it. We get to the first level, second level, third level, has spectacular views of Long Island Sound. I didn't like the way I could sort of feel heat coming up from the ground. So, okay, everybody go down. They went down to two, they go down to one. And while I was working my way down to one, I, I had someone call out, you, you. <laughs> and I'm looking up and I see it's the wife of a Bronx Supreme Court justice, a judge. And I go, oh my God, the guy must have, I hope he didn't have a heart attack. I run back up. And there he is walking back and forth. It was too high for him. When he looked over, he couldn't go down. And so I asked the wife to please, please go down. And I said, told, I yelled down, everybody go down, go down, get away from this. And now I had to go to the judge. <laughs> and the judge was beside himself. I can't do it. Can't do it. No, judge, we have to go down. You can't stay up here. I, I can't do it, doc. I can't do it. No, no, you, you have to do it. Okay, I'll, I'll take care of it. He said, what do you mean? I said, I'll carry you down. You'll carry me down. No, you can't carry me. I'm a judge. And with that, I threw him over my shoulder in a fireman's carry and ran down Tallapoosa Point. Well, from that point on, the judge never spoke to me again. And anytime he ever saw me at some affair, Democratic Club, Chamber of Commerce, something, he would run away from me. But his wife would always come over to me and say these words, oh, the man who saved my husband. Anyway, I thought you'd like that one. Okay, next, the Marina del Rey. Oh, here's the Henry Hudson Memorial statue, which is in Henry Hudson Park. There he is, it's 100 feet tall, and there's the mighty Henry Hudson looking at the river. Of course, this is in Riverdale, obviously, and Mount St. Vincent. Next. No, that can't be, <laughs> go back then. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> so just go back to the, uh, yeah, uh, just stay with the waterway. 
One of the things we've not really talked about too much is how the Bronx really sets itself up. The Bronx Historical Society understands that we have to do, we have to be part of the, of, of the, the, the education system in every possible way. That was the reason to do this book. That was its main reason. In fact, probably the only reason, uh, except that it had never been done before. And while there are many other pieces in the book, I'm not going to take more time. We're already an hour or so into it. But I do want you to understand that this really was a labor of love, but it was so necessary that we have this type of thing and that it be available. It was such a big thing that we then decided that we would create a workbook called the, uh, the Bronx Geography Workbook that we could then give to students in the Bronx so they would have some way in which they could understand what exactly is this wonderful, wonderful place and how we can manage it in the best possible way and understand which way we're going next and how we're going next. Finally, I want to talk about streets and avenues. According to the Planning Commission, New York City, there are 1,350 miles of roads. Everybody always asks, what's the longest road? White Plains Road, 7.3 miles. Second longest, Tremont Avenue, seven miles. Cross Bronx Expressway is seven miles. Been a pleasure talking to you today. I hope you've enjoyed this. I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you, Doc, very interesting. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to the audience now for the Q&A. Uh, if you'd like, I can read your question or you can just uh, answer live. So Michael Werner, if you'd like to- uh, Michael like to Werner, yes, Michael Werner, I know him well. He's not answering, he's not talking, so it's a great presentation. I'm sure you remember me and Dan Karpinen. Remember that reenactment on a cold, snowy day when we were dressed like Hessian soldiers at Bainbridge Avenue. Unfortunately, I lost track of Dan. How is uh, Lloyd Oltan doing? He's doing fine. He still teaches at Fairleigh Dickinson University. Um, yes, I do remember Dan Carpenter. And uh, we did these recreations. And my my only job was to, to get... Uh, uh, chunks of meat and carrots and potatoes because we couldn't pay for these guys. We were all dressed up. So uh, Zoom user Anonymous would like to know, is so, so during wartime, New York had enough manpower to go to war and deal with land growth, question mark. Or how do they have enough manpower to go to war and deal with land growth? Uh, maybe it's what they wanted. Say. Well, I mean, the answer to that is they didn't have land growth during the war. Remember, there was all sorts of needs. They, they did not have, uh, there was tremendous uh, coverage. They could not buy gas easily. There was, uh, they would have drives for metal because they used them for tanks and planes. So no, that, there was no real development during during wartime. This World War II was an all out effort. Uh, Tony Plata would like to know, did the water tunnel system flood the Kingsbridge Armory? I don't think so. I've never heard that one before. I mean, I suppose it could be if one of the pipes broke. You know, there was a period of time. People don't understand how, how active the Kingsbridge Armory. There were, there were football games in there. Baseball, there was, they would ride bicycles. They used to do three and four day bicycle rides. Um, in the in the armory itself, and it still was it was an active armory. Then it in the I'm not sure what the date was, probably in the 80s, 1980s. It then became a homeless shelter for a while. It supposedly still is. There are seven levels below the street level. The building is gargantuan. I mean, it's just unbelievable. But it's no longer used as an armory. So I don't know about the flooding business, but I not really heard that one. Uh, Doug Leff would like to know, is the Bronx Park tablet still around? Yes, there were a number of them. You have to go look for them. Francie. It's in every one of those parks. You just got to know where it is. You know who knows? the? Um, well, the Van Colton administrator knows, the Pelham Park, Bay Park administrator knows. The Parks Department of Bronx, they have a list of where they're located. And I just took a picture of that, or I had someone take a picture of that. Uh, Francie says, the Bronx, the Hague, the Vatican. How do you account for the noble thus? 
because it's named after the mighty river that courses through its entire length, the Bronx River. And Bronx comes from the first European settler, Jonas Bronck, B-R-O-N-C-K, but it was eventually anglicized to X, B-R-O-N-X. He came here in 1639 and established a tradition of believing in two years. <laughs> he left by 1641. So that's why it's the Bronx. We're named after the river. Edward uh, Meekman would like to know, is there a map of the monuments in the Bronx? You mean, gen monument? no, there is no map. I mean, there are, you can go online and find things, um, just like you could find the highest point. You know, again, that the, the owner doesn't like anyone going up there. And I think he put a fence up around it now, so you can't even go see it. No, there isn't one. It's an interesting idea, but there are a lot of monuments. Uh, Alan Priest would like to know what happened to Shorehaven and the other beach clubs. Well, Alan, <laughs> that's my cousin, my my Italian cousin. Um, well, Alan, Shorehaven was this wondrous place that uh, many families utilized. Um, it was at the end of Clawson Point and uh, had a very large pool, very large pool, and courts and baseball fields and all sorts of events. I think I, I think people saw Chubby Checker there. Remember the Chubby Checker and the uh, twist? Anyway, it uh, eventually, people were not using it anymore, and so eventually sold out, and now these close and point, it was all these houses. But when I went there to see what the new houses looked like, the apartment buildings, what I noticed was that the planes coming off of uh, the airport, which is very close by in Queens, you know, LaGuardia Airport, they were flying so low, you could actually see the pilot. I remember seeing a guy with, with a mustache. It was really quite interesting. And yet these buildings was about four or five stories tall. I hope I answered that one. Uh, Maria Sanchez would like to know, why was the Williams Bridge Reservoir uh, filled in? Well, it wasn't filled in. It was emptied. That's the main thing. It was emptied. And it was that Moses, Robert Moses and his group on the Parks Department decided we needed more land. And they really didn't need it anymore because the the, the system worked well enough. It, it wasn't necessary to have that. There's still a Reservoir Keeper's House, Marshall Montefiore Community Center. Um, Marshall Montefiore um, Center, I guess is what we call, actually owns that building. It's right on the other side. You could actually walk by and see it. That was the keeper's house. Uh, Lorraine Quinones says, this was a wonderful lecture. I was born and uh, raised in the Bronx and didn't really appreciate it until I had my own children. We are a Bronx homeschooling family, ages 13, 11, and 5. And I'll be sure to be more oh. intentional to add the Bronx, uh, history, to add, uh, Bronx history into our everyday learning. Uh, thank you for your time. Well, that's wonderful. Uh, thank you very Happy much. Thank you very much. Uh, Julia uh, Pelletier is asking, I'm writing a book based in the Bronx in the 1970s. My character is a teenager uh, who is half Irish, half Polish. She's from a working class family and lives in a working class neighborhood with a population of mostly African-Americans and Hispanics. What neighborhood she, could she possibly have lived in? Uh, Mott Haven, Marsania, um, quite a few, in fact, quite, quite a few. Judy Kernan says, I enjoyed the webinar. There's a lot about the Bronx I didn't know about. And um, Bradley Fenton asks a couple of times, Roberto Clemente's name came up, Roberto Clemente State Park, for example. He played in Pittsburgh. He was from Puerto Rico. How did his name become attached to Bronx sites? Someone loved his name. Someone loved the great Roberto Clemente. And so they named it after him. We didn't control the name. It's a state park. So it was controlled. So obviously someone really loved Roberto Clemente. Dennis Camp asked, the area of the Johnson Foundry is now in Inwood Hill Park. Is that correct? So it was in Westchester, then the Bronx, then Manhattan. Correct. Well, if you look at that map, it's in the book. It'll show you how that describes itself. A piece of it is part of Inwood, but the other part is just carved out. It's really where the they just took it away. That was that 
because they had to make it a little straighter. They couldn't keep going around. It was a big loop. So they made it straight from the Broadway Bridge right through to the to the Hudson River. Mrs. H asks, uh, ge geographically, where was the hospital at Walton Avenue in the Bronx? My father-in-law was born there in 1919, and has the area changed mu much since then? <laughs> Those are the kind of questions that you should call up freely. The man in front of you, right there. He will look that, or the research library, and they'll fill you in on the Walton Avenue Hospital, or a number of hospitals, quite a few hospitals, still are. I sent her my email address. Uh, Francie, Mod Haven, in all caps, will you venture a prediction? What's happening in 20 years hence? Well, that's really come up tremendously, and there's a lot of new housing in the Mod Haven area. So I, I would say the Bronx is uh, on a very plus side now. Plus side. Good things are happening. Like this talk? Yes. <laughs> Gary Chirico says, thank you. Great presentation. You had a picture of a rock from Ice Age that you would talk about later. Is that split rock? That split rock. That was earlier. Yes. The one with the tree in it, which doesn't have a tree anymore, but it's split rock in Pelham Bay Park. And in fact, if you will have me, I'll finish one last story as a conclusion, unless you have more questions. You have more questions? I just people saying thank you. Okay, no. So no more questions. So here's here's my last story of the day. Okay, we visited, we we decided the historical society to visit Split Rock. Okay, it's much easier to get to Split Rock from the Hudson River Parkway. So we brought a, a group of four cars. I wasn't driving, I was in one of the cars. And because to get it from the Split Rock golf course, it's a lot of brambles there. It's, it's actually difficult. But the rock is not that far from the highway itself. So we pulled off the highway, we went to it. With us was the inimitable John McNamara, where well, you've heard me talk about him. He, he was an extraordinary historian who spent 40 years of his life working on the uh, history and asphalt, the origin of Bronx Street and place names encyclopedia. That was the man who did that. And so we're, we're, he and I are talking and, you know, we're looking at the rock and there's, you know, after a while, there's not much more to see in the rock. But everybody was talking, maybe 10, 12 people. And the next thing I know, John starts walking north. All right, and so I'll go with him. I'll, so I went with him. And I realized he's going very fast. And so all of a sudden, he comes to where 95 is, where the highway is, where Hudson River and the Hudson River Parkway and, the, and 95 come together. The next thing I know, he runs across the highway. And now he's in the median of the highway. And he's breathing very heavy. Well, he's like 79 years old. And he's really, it's really a rough day. And I realized, oh my God, it's John. I got, I got to do something. So I work my way over to him. And now we're both on the median. And I say, okay, John, just take a breath. Take it easy. Just relax. Uh, uh, um, okay, he's breathing hard. He says, I said, why are, you, why are we here? And he goes, well, on the other side there is a whole area, which we didn't discuss, there's a lot of things to discuss in this book <clears throat> that has streets that are actually part of the Bronx, but are in Westchester. <clears throat> he wanted to go see it. I said, all right, we, we can do that. I mean, so we waited for it to, to really slow down. <clears throat> no traffic. We nonchalantly walked across. We had to go up a big embankment and we went into someone's backyard. Okay. We went through the backyard, came out and they came out of the gate. And immediately were screamed at by the owners. What right do you have? We're going to call the police. You are terrible people. You're crazy to run across the highway. And I finally said, well, well, I just want you to know, this is John McNamara. And we, and I started to talk about it. And they went, John McNamara? This is John McNamara? And John goes, well, well yes. And so they said, well, John, come come in, come in. And now we were sitting in their living room having tea and crumpets. <clears throat> and they're really, does everyone know what a crumpet is? It's actually, you know, it's cakes, tea and cakes. And they're really like wild about the fact that John is there and the, the, the great historian is there and they're calling all their neighbors, all these Bronxites 
who are in Westchester County. And they're calling them, come in and see John McNamara. And they're coming in and they're, everybody's happy and talking. And it's one that they didn't call the police, thankfully. And everything is good. And then it's John, do you want something to drink? Yes, he, he grabbed a little scotch. He's happy. Everything is going well. Well, of course, all the people that we went with, they don't know where we are. There were no cell phones at that point. And so, but someone had seen us maybe go over there. You know, maybe they really went across the highway. And so an hour later, our team came up. And they were very happy to see we were okay and they brought us in. Now, the end of that story is John loved it. I loved it. It was a great story. The city of New York decided that finally John McNamara should be honored with his own street. So they came up in Throg's Neck where he was... He was born, he was not born, but he spent most of his life in the Throgs Neck area. And so they, they right off of the, uh, the Whitestone Expressway, there was a section that they named McNamara Square. Only, unfortunately, it's a triangle, <laughs> which bothered him no end. And a week before he passed away, he, he had told me about this. He had, he had called me about it before. And he said that he finally visited his square and had some ice cream. He died at like 85 years of age, a wonderful guy. And he is why the geography of the Bronx really works. Thank you one and all. The pleasure. We'll see you again. Oh, thank you. Um, and please go on our website. Uh, we're going to send out a link tomorrow with where you can buy the book. Uh, there's a special deal if you get the geography of the Bronx and the Bronx geography workbook. So please do that. Um, and we have some other people saying, thank you. Love the stories about exploring the Bronx. The, the Bronx is back against all odds. Thank you, Bronx Historical Society. And th th thank you, Doc. You're Very quite good. welcome. Excellent talk. You're quite welcome. All right. Good night, everyone. Thank you for coming. Good night, one and all.